Hey, Tim, put your hat on. Put your hat on. Put your hat on. Huh? Huh? Twins. Twins. All right. <laughs> only, only way you can tell us apart is if we have... Take our hat off. That's right. Because I got, I got more hair than you got. All right. Hey, uh, I got I owe, I owe Kepler a big, big thank you this week, man. He sings the national anthem at Anaheim Stadium for the Angels games about eight or ten times a year. Knowing that I love the Yankees, who played there, are playing there this weekend, he took me to the game, all right? Now... That was not me, that was Eccles who went with me, had his Yankee shirt on, all right? Number one, he does a great job singing the national anthem, but he also sang at the seventh inning stretch. And uh, I moved a little slow, but I got a short clip of it, all right? So check out the screen. And you could tell where I was seated, right, while he was singing that. You know, uh, for the first uh, half of the game, we sat just about 15 rows up from third base. Really, really. And I've sat on seats similar to that at other, you know, games. And I looked at people behind home plate and I thought, that's not any better than where I'm sitting. At the fifth inning, we get to move over. Those seats are better than where I have ever sat before, all right? Ten rows behind home plate, pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, let me tell you, Kepler is a rock star at Anaheim Stadium. From the door guys to the concession people, the owner comes and shakes his hand and thanks him for singing the national anthem. All right, that is cool, all right. So, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I've had a really, really good weekend. All right, uh... We did not make reservations for a place to stay Friday night because we, we, I didn't want to drive back, get home at three in the morning. But I just figured, ah, there, there, there are plenty of places around, okay? So uh, Eccles and I get into uh, the Starbucks right across the street from Anaheim Stadium because Kepler said, don't be late. And so we weren't going to be late. We were plenty early. And um, this is hilarious. This is true. There were 15 Yankee fans in that Starbucks and one Angels fan. <laughs> and we sat down with the Angels fan and uh, we're visiting for a few moments. I said, oh, Bill, I said, let me, let me see if that Embassy Suites got a room for us. And this guy looks at us and said, you came down here on a Friday right next door to Disneyland and you didn't have a room? I said, ah, oh, no, we got it covered. Embassy was full. The other Embassy was full, but she said, hey, let me call our double tree. They're one of our partners. We'll see if they have room. Just three-tenths of a mile farther than us. Great. Yeah, they got a room. No problem. So we're in. Little more than I planned on paying, but we're in. All right? <laughs> so we thought, hey, we have time to go check in before the game. Just drop our stuff off. Come right back. Still won't be late meeting Cap. So uh, we run over to the double tree. We walk into the uh, lobby there are a minimum of 300 Hispanic women in the lobby. <laughs> it is a lively place. There's a line here, all right? I said, we're not getting in beforehand, okay? And so I come, we come back after the game. It's quieter. There's no line to wait, but it's 1030. And so I told the lady, we checked in. I said, you know, we were here. For, I hope you still have our room. I said, we were here a few hours ago, but there were a lot of women down here. And she's laughing. She said, yeah. He said, it's, it's a, uh, uh, a Hispanic Baptist church is having a convention here. And she said, she said you know, I, I, think, uh, I, I think they'll be, be relatively quiet because they're Baptists. <laughs> I didn't bring up the fact that it was a thousand women, all right? I, I didn't bring that up. So uh, Eccles and I get in the elevator the next morning and there's about, there, there, there's, there's, there's six ladies in there and they look at us and they said, 
you do know there's a thousand Hispanic women in the hotel today, don't you? I said, yes, and she said, beware. <laughs> so, so anyway, back, back to being at the desk clerk there. We're standing there, and she said, um, uh, oh, yes, well, I see your reservation, Mr. Rowland. She said, um, did you enjoy the game? I said, oh, yeah, it was a great game. I'm a Yankee fan, sorry, but we, we won. She said, oh. she said, that's really good. She said, did you plan on enjoying some hors d'oeuvres and a beverage before you turned in for the night? And I said, well, actually, yeah, we were uh, going to go get a snack. And she said, great, here's a $20 gift certificate. Go, and, go enjoy yourself. And I said, great. She said, did you park your car already? And I said, yeah, self-parking. I said, she said, it's normally $17 a night, but tonight it's free. It's on us. I said, Wow, wonderful. And, and uh, she said, you know, you were charged the premium rate for your room. And she said, uh, we're going to give that to you for $50 less. The non same room, but $50 less than what it was. And I'm saying, man, how did I hit the lotto tonight? You know, am I the 1,000th customer or something? And she said, no, uh, your room will be ready in about 20 minutes. <laughs> So, which was fine, which was fine, because we, you know, it turned out actually perfect. And um, so anyway, it was a great trip, and now it's rodeo day, and it's going to be 75 degrees. It just doesn't get better for me than this, guys, all right? And Shelly went on vacation this morning, and, and uh, no. <laughs> she did, she did, she did. She's on her way to Cabo with Kathy Critchfield, all right? And so, uh, but that's not why this is going to be a great week, all right? Please. <laughs> Please do not any of you text her and say that I said this is going to fawn. Do not say that, all right? Do not say that. Uh, but anyway, so we hope she has a great time. And um, yeah, I better just move right along before I end up in trouble here. Fawn! Uh, wait, 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 wait. If you are a guest today, welcome to New Hope Church. Don't normally take that much time talking about frivolous things, but uh, I'm stoked from the weekend. If you are here today at your first time, you honor us by your presence. I would love for you to take a communication card that's in the pew in front of you, fill it out. When we have our offering in a bit, drop it in the offering bag. Next week through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about New Hope. We promise not to beat on your door, pester you on the phone, but through the mail, send you information that we hope will be helpful. Those cards are for all of our children church family too. Uh, messages to the staff, prayer requests, updates, please use those every Tuesday morning as a staff. We meet and we review those and pray for them. And so um, they're very, very valuable to us. So thank you for doing that. If you haven't been here for a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks, I ask everybody to take a selfie and send it to the church. All right. IT at newhopechurch.net. If you haven't done that, please do that for us. All right. That's helping us put names and faces together. When we talk to staff about somebody, we, we're not selling it to Google or anybody. All right. It's just helping us. Remember, I'm past 60 now. So remembering names and faces together, this is very, very helpful for us as a staff. So just do that here after you get home and uh, shoot it to us because it really is helpful. Uh, Fawn Boss, our women's ministry director, has some really important things to share with us today. A couple of them a little bit delicate, okay? So uh, you guys had a retreat last weekend. Yes, we did. We, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yep. I don't know why I'm holding We can this, hear you now. Told me to hear it. Uh, welcome for Rodeo Sunday, by the way. Um, I don't always wear a hat. Uh, we got here this morning, people were going, where's your hat, where's your hat? So Julie and I both called our husbands to bring hats. Julie, stand up for a second, would you? And obviously we know who the good girl, cowgirl is and who the bad cowgirl is. <laughs> Wasn't planned, but she's all in white and I'm in black, so good on you. Anyway, we went to retreat, we had a great... <laughs> oh, well, things aren't always go that appropriate. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, we went to retreat, had a great time. We had 35 women from New Hope that went. These are our retreat shirts, which we ordered ahead of time, but I really feel like it was God-ordained because we got up there, and the theme for the week was faith, hope, and love, but there was an overwhelming sense of joy through the whole uh, retreat that everybody noticed. So uh, they were talking about it Friday night, and on Saturday when we all came out wearing, their, uh, wearing these shirts, they were all excited, and, and the women loved them. We like these shirts because it's a good message no matter who you are. If you're wearing these out in the public and Christians see you, they, they, you know where their head goes. But if they're not Christians and they see this, it's still a good message to think about what you're choosing in life because joy is a choice. And I'm not talking about giddy, happy, just, you know, laughing all the time, silliness. I'm talking about true joy in knowing um, 
Jesus and what he does for us. No matter what we're going through, we all go through hard times. You see all this junk on the news that can really get you down. If you put your focus back on Jesus, that's where the joy comes in because he's got this. You know, I read the back of the book and we win. So he knows how all this stuff is going to come out. It's up to us to make the right choice to keep our focus where it needs to be. So having said all that, if you like these shirts, ladies, because we've had many of you see them and wish they had some, I'm going to be out in the pavilion in between the services take your order. They're $10 a piece. I have to give a disclaimer because I didn't do this earlier. The bling I have on here, I did myself after I got the shirt. So it's not going to come with bling, but you can bling it yourself if you want. But the best part of the message is joy. So if you want one, I'll be out in the pavilion and take your orders and they should be back to, for delivery by Mother's Day. Um, and we take checks. <laughs> okay. The next announcement I have, this is the one that's a little delicate for me. Oh yeah, there's our women at the retreat. Thank you. Don't they look joyful and happy? It was a great, God just blessed us tremendously up there. It was probably the best retreat ever. But um, the next thing I want to talk about, we, uh, it's a little bit delicate, and uh, we don't talk about this very often in church, um, and so that's why I'm doing the announcement, not Tim, but I want to talk about women's underwear. <laughs> See? That's what I'm saying. It's delicate. Now, before I tell you why I want to talk about women's underwear, I do want to say we have an awesome quilt club at this church led by Emma Rowland, and seven of our, several of our ladies are involved and have been for years. They've made hundreds of quilts that have gone throughout the world, literally, to cancer fighters, survivors, people with other illnesses. They've gone to Africa, um, across the United States, and they've been a blessing to many, many people. And these ladies meet twice a month, and they just quilt their little hearts out. And they, they do it. It's their ministry. They do it joyfully and, and for a purpose. Well, we, we've asked them to do something new this year. Um, 1040i, one of the focuses we have over there are, of course, it's water, education, and, and health. And we really focus on the health of the people there, particularly the women who haven't ever been taught how to really take care of themselves well and, you know, um, have rough pregnancies and afterwards and everything. So we're, we're educating them. But the Quilt Club has made... 250 uh, feminine kits that we are going to send over there this year for the young ladies there. And the, uh, they're, they're just about finished. They've been working on them for months. But now we need women's underwear. We need two pair for each kit, which means we need 500 uh, pair of underwear. So we're asking next Sunday, we've designated May 6th as Undie Sunday around here. <laughs> around here at New Hope. Around here, so invite a friend. No, um, uh, <laughs> we, who knows? We might get more people. It might be crowded. Put up chairs. Um, but we're so if you will go out and we we need you to purchase some underwear for these kits for us. Now, um, we what we want are briefs, women's briefs, size seven or eight. Now I'm going to clarify this. We do not want this. No granny panties. Okay. We do not want this one. None. Okay. Don't get those. What we want are a package of these. You can buy them at Walmart, Target. They come in six or ten, but again, it says briefs on there, size seven or eight. Um, so if you can bring those, we will have a, a, somebody out here in the pavilion next Sunday with a box. Just bring them and put them in the box, and we, we're very grateful for all you can do. If we get more than 500, there's enough room in the kits for a couple more pair of underwear. So um, go for it. Don't be afraid. So next week, Andy Sunday, here at New Hope, and we thank you in advance for what you're doing because this makes, might not seem like a big deal to us, but it's a tremendous deal uh, for these young women over there in Africa. And they have to be sent out in July. That's why we're doing it now. Um, the last announcement is just a, a brief one. It's not happening, and I, I, I just understood it's, it's wrong in, in your... Um, bulletin. It's not May 19th. On May 26th, we are going to have a crochet, a one-day crochet and knitting class. And what this is for is, uh, you know, at the end of the year when the youth always make the Operation Christmas Child boxes and we fill them and send them? Well, Bernice Osborne in our um, uh, New Hope Church here, she's been making little uh, crocheted caps to put in those for, an, for another organization that she's working with. And we heard about that. We thought, what an awesome idea. And so Bernice is going to show you how to crochet, and Nan Isom's going to come and show you how to knit caps that day. And we're, uh, that way you can just start working on them through the summer, and as many as you can get made and bring them back to the office, the, the high school kids will make sure they get put in those boxes to send out to the kids throughout the world. So if you're interested in learning how to crochet, this is, Bernice assures me, this is a pretty simple one to do. 
It's a great time to come to this one-day class. She'll show you if you can put up the net. Oh, there, that's it right there. You buy, come and buy the kits. They're at, they're at Walmart and Target. That's the loom kit. It has three little loom things, whatever they're called in there. We're going to use the smallest one, but come prepared. And we'll, we'll announce more about it later so you're ready. But this is great. If you want to learn how to crochet, you've got a teenager that wants to learn or bring a friend from you know, your neighborhood, the class will probably only take a couple hours. But we'll get, we'll get that project started so that we can be working on it through the summer and in, into the fall just before we start. So thank you very much for your attention. I know that was a lot today, but I appreciate it. On this Sunday, next week. I have no idea what I'm going to preach about on Undy Sunday. I tell you, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little mystified. Um, but anyway, thank you, Fawn, for handling that so delicately today. Great job. Uh, actually, um, I watched Bernice when she was at the hospital with us, when Dad, uh, when Dad was in the hospital, and Bernice would reach into her big bag and pull out this little round thing, and she would just start crocheting and I was watching her and I actually kind of thought it was kind of fun watching her sit there in the wedding room I, what are you making those for and that's yeah so men you can come on the day that it's there if you'd like to learn how to do this but and then I said what's it for and I said well man we do that here we ought to get folks involved in that and add a little something extra because the uh, the boxes that we send to kids through Samaritan's Purse are in a very cold part of the world and so to have a knitted cap all right would be really really cool for them and so uh, keep that date in mind and if you can participate that would be great uh, let me highlight a few few things and then we'll get engaged in worship. Angel Tree Football Camp where we help uh, kids who have an incarcerated parent. That's coming up May the 19th. It's going to be at Edison High. If you would like to sign up for that, uh, contact e either Teddy uh, Miller. You can contact him at Teddy at newhopechurch.net. See him. He's here in service at this service right now. Uh, you can get one of the communication cards. Write your name and contact information and say Angel Tree Football Camp and someone will reach out to you. But what a great day that is going to be for the kids here in the Central Valley. Um, out at the table, you will find uh, Mark Addis, our associate pastor. He's got a variety of things out there. One of them is the Decision Tour, Billy Graham Association with Franklin Graham event. Uh, that is on Memorial Day evening, all right, the last Monday of the month of May at the Fresno Fairgrounds. It's the Decision America California Tour. In uh, a little over 32 days, he's going to be in 10 cities uh, preaching the message of Jesus Christ. And uh, Fresno is on that Monday evening. Uh, uh, Jeremy Camp is going to be the uh, keynote vocalist that evening, so it should be a great night. You can get packages like this. This is 25 invitations uh, if you want to give to neighbors or friends and invite them out to that evening, and you can see Mark out there. There's also going to be another training for being part of the prayer team at the end of the service where you can engage people who have come forward to invite Christ in their life and lead them in that next most important step. A few of us were there. About 100 people from the community were there, and some from New Hope. This past week. There's going to be another one, not this week, but the following week. And next Sunday, we'll give you the particulars on that because the particulars haven't been set yet. Um, National Day of Prayer is this Thursday. And for the city of Clovis, it is uh, uh, at the... Um, uh, across from Clark Intermediate Junior High, and it's at City Hall, and we will start promptly at 12 to 12.05. We'll be finished by 12.45. Would love to have you come out as we pray for our city, uh, our valley, our state, and our country. And so come join us for that. If you'd rather go to the citywide one in Fresno, it'll be at 6 o'clock at Fresno Pacific University. All right. Um, we raised money, you recall, a couple of weeks ago for our junior high kids to go to camp. Camp was almost $600 for junior high kids to go. Uh, we've got over 20 kids going. Uh, the results of that fundraiser that day and ongoing contributions by many of you, uh, none of our junior high kids will have to pay more than 100 bucks. All right, so you guys did awesome, awesome. 
And some of those kids who were there and working probably will end up paying nothing because of the investment time that they spent there. So thank you for making that possible for all of them. Now we have a chance to help our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And that's the pasta feed that's coming up on Sunday evening, five o'clock on May the 20th. And I have a sign up sheet to go around. This is much like our, uh, our uh, pie auction. Um, you guys are going to sign up here and you're gonna volunteer to either make pasta, bring bread, uh, a salad, or bring something that can go in the raffle that we will give away from raffle gifts that day. You can sign up today to help do that. So here's the deal. You provide the raffle gifts, you provide the food, and then you come pay to get a raffle gift and, buy, and eat the food. It's a wonderful gig, all right? And you guys, you're so good at it. So we just say thank you all the time. So this is the signups that will help the, uh, the folks who are doing that. Uh, put your name, your contact information, and then check off any one or multiple items that you're going to help with, all right? And they appreciate that very, very much. And this really helps out our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, Tony and Debbie Alcorda, normally in this service, all right, normally sitting three rows from the back on the aisle when they're here. Um, they were in a motorcycle wreck, and both of them were injured. Uh, they're not in the hospital, though they did go to the hospital. They were uh, treated and they're released, but they are home recovering. So please be remembered to pray for uh, Debbie and Tony Alcorda. I know they would appreciate that very much. Jerry Molinari will be having surgery tomorrow at Clovis Community Hospital. Uh, his daughter, if you recall, just a week and a half ago had surgery, and she is recovering well, and we hope Jerry will do as well as she does. We got great news from Bernie Krause. Part of our eight o'clock crowd most of the time, uh, retired uh, uh, Central Valley Community Bank uh, administrator. And uh, as you know, he was waiting to get results back from a PET scan to see if the cancer was anywhere else in his body. Uh, he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, uh, did not know what stage it was. Uh, he got the best news you could possibly get this week. And that is, it is nowhere else in his body and it is at stage one. And so that is great news for Bernie. We rejoice with him over that. He still has important decisions to make. He's consulting with the specialist this week as they explain the two treatments that are used for his particular uh, challenge. And then they will make a decision before the week is over on which one of the treatments that they will be following up on. He said the good news is he won't be losing his hair through chemotherapy, just through old age uh, <laughs> at this stage. So uh, his, his sense, sense of humor is really great about it, but that is wonderful, wonderful news. So uh, those are just a couple of the updates dates we wanted to bring you today. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Gentlemen, would you come? Would you join with me as we pray and give thanks? Uh, Pop, I see you made it to service number two today. Stand up, Dad. All right. He's got his rodeo gear on. Um, for the first time in our lives, uh, I weigh more than my father, okay? Uh, after his hospital stay and his two surgery procedures, uh, he's lost some weight. Uh, guys, stay close to him because uh, his pants do not, or his belt does not have another hole in it, and so uh, they might drop to his ankles before the day is over, so keep an eye on him, guys. All right, but he is doing so well. Thank you for your prayers. We are very, very grateful. Would you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for, personally, thank you for this weekend. This has just been a really, really good weekend. Thank you. Um, Father, you desire to be our sufficiency in life, whether our weekends are good or bad or indifferent. You desire to be the sufficiency of our lives, not only when we are in trouble, but when things are going great. You want to be the source of everything in our life. You never want to leave us to ourselves. Because, Father, left to ourselves, our good days can rapidly become a bad day. And then we are left to ourselves to figure our way out. You want to be there through it all. I trust we will grow in the understanding of that truth and that principle and then the expression of your life in us in both the good, the bad, and the mundane. Father, we trust you with needs that we've already shared here today for those who uh, are recuperating from surgery, those who have surgery pending, those recuperating from accidents and illness, uh, those who are still awaiting results of tests. Father, we, we just 
simply trust you for all of them. However, you can use various ones of us in the congregation to be of encouragement or hope or, or just simply a presence to be near. I hope you find us ready, willing, and available. Lord, for Elaine in our church who um, lost her mother-in-law and her granddaughter lost her great-grandmother this week, um, we commit to you their needs for your care and your comfort. Um, Lord, you brought us all here today for a purpose. Some here for the very first time. Others, they've been here a few times. Some of us have been here for years. But um, this is a divine appointment for all of us. You have something to say to each of us. And I hope we'll have the ears to hear and the will that will be... Uh, willing to follow your leadership. Uh, Father, as the message of, of your Son, the Lord Jesus, is presented today both through music and through word, uh, may we have ears to hear your voice in our hearts. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing, Lord, and the way in which uh, we not only want to meet the needs that New Hope Church has as part of your kingdom work, but Father, as we use the resources for the kingdom not only locally but also globally to carry the message of Jesus Christ to any and all that you provide us the opportunity. Thank you for that privilege. In Christ's name we pray and are grateful. Amen. Amen. As an old preacher used to say, if you can't preach after that, your wood's wet. All right? Man, that is good stuff. Uh, If you entered New Hope Sanctuary today and your sins had not yet been washed away, I hope by the time that you leave here today, you can, without reservation, know the reality of complete forgiveness of all your sin and know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. We are preaching a series. We're on uh, Sunday number three of What's Up With Heaven. We're going to be taking a close look at what it is we have to look forward to when we leave this world. As we found out from a fifth grade Sunday school class, from one little boy in that class, in order to go to heaven, what do you have to do first? Die. You gotta die. <laughs> um, from a fifth grader, that sounds pretty humorous. In a hospital room, it doesn't always seem that humorous. The reality is, the doorway to an eternal Disneyland. That's the best word I can come in human expressions to describe what I think heaven's gonna be like. In John's day, he said streets of gold and gates of pearl. That was the best in their world they could come up with to describe how grand it is for me. Think about the wild, crazy Disneyland you can imagine and heaven's going to be better than that. But the entrance is the valley of the shadow of death. And so this whole subject of death as believers in Christ has to be dealt with. And I believe somehow the 21st century needs to capture the attitude towards what seems to be the most dreaded moment in the world. We need to recapture the attitude of first century Christians. We somehow need to come to a point where Paul was when he said, I'm stuck between two very difficult decisions. Now, when he said two difficult decisions, they weren't bad. Let me put it to you this way. If behind door number one, there was a million dollars. If behind door number two, there was a million dollars worth of stuff, which door would you choose? See, difficult choice, right? but both of them filled with great blessing. So Paul said, I'm stuck between two really tough choices. Do I die and go see Jesus face to face or do I live a little longer and still preach Jesus to my family and friends? Two good choices. And what's recorded for us is Paul didn't make a choice. <laughs> Paul said, I'll leave that choice in the hands of the Lord Jesus, and I will live with either one of those choices. And ultimately, he got both. He lived a little longer, <laughs> and then he died and saw Jesus face to face. So today, we're going to wrap up looking at the subject of death. So in the weeks to come, we take this closer look. And I hope, if you didn't know Jesus before today, and you're here, 
that you find him before this service is over so that as you come back and we'll take a closer look at heaven, you will know more about where it is that you're going. Um, my mom and I, when we traveled, and most of our travels were from California to Oklahoma. But in our travels, my mom and I enjoyed this a bit more than the rest of the family, but we enjoyed stopping at out-of-the-way cemeteries and strolling through the graveyard. We were looking for things like, who's the oldest person buried here? How long ago did they die? We looked for what was written on headstones because they were often interesting. And so we enjoyed that. And, and, and you can also Google epitaphs on headstones and you will come up with big lists. Let me share with you five epitaphs that I have found interesting on headstones. Some of them I've seen in the cemetery. Some of them I got off Google. All right. Here's one very interesting one. Here lies Ann Mann, M-A-N-N, who lived an old maid but died an old man. <laughs> she wrote that herself, all right? Had her family sign a document, they would do that. Here's another one. Beneath the sod, a lump of clay, lies Arabella Young, who on the 21st of May began to hold her tongue. <laughs> she had the reputation in her community of being the town gossip. She did not request that on her tombstone, but that is what her husband put there. <laughs> the children of Israel wanted bread. The Lord sent them manna. Old Clark Wallace wanted a wife. The devil sent him Anna. <laughs> it's a good thing she went first, so that would have never been put on the headstone, all right? This is number four. This is my, one of my favorites. Here lies Johnny Yeast. Forgive me for not rising. <laughs> you gotta love that one, man. Last one. Under the sod and under the trees lies the body of Jonathan Pease. He's not there, only his pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. <laughs> that one is good, you gotta love that one. Though, though all of these are funny, but when we think about it seriously, what will our tombstone say? You've heard this, but just a quick highlight, you know, on most tombstones is date of birth and date of death. And where the real story is, is the dash in between. What people remember is the way we lived in between those two significant moments in our life. There was a man who went for a physical and he got a call from his doctor a couple of days later. And the doctor said, I've got bad news and I've got worse news. Which do you want first? He said, well, give me the bad news. He said, well, the tests show that you have 48 hours to live. That's the bad news? That is the worst news I've ever heard. How can that be worse than what you've got left? And the doctor said, I should have called you yesterday. <laughs> death, um, the, the subject of death makes many, many folks uncomfortable. They avoid it. For some, it makes them angry and they ignore it. Um, I cannot tell you how many times in my work as a pastor, I've had family members try to get me to talk to their family members about this subject. They want somebody else to talk to their relatives about, you need to get your things in order. Are you ready to die? Do you know if you're going to heaven? I'm not sure why relatives can't have that conversation themselves, but somehow they like to enlist a hitman to do it for them. Back in September of 2004, Casey Neistat of New York City discovered that the battery in his first generation five gigabyte iPad would no longer hold a charge for more than an hour. So he called Apple. Unfortunately for him, Apple basically advised him to buy a new iPad. And their prices were kind of expensive. They did not have a battery replacement policy at that time. Neistat was very upset and he decided that since Apple wasn't going to replace his battery for him, he would do it himself. So he bought an off-brand battery for 50 bucks. He sat down, opened up his iPad, and promptly broke it. Now, it didn't matter what kind of battery he had. It was never going to work again. Neistat was so infuriated that he started an Internet site called iPadsDirtySecret.com. 
and it featured him on a video spray painting the phrase, iPads unreplaceable battery lasts only 18 months all over the city of Manhattan. This got Apple's attention. They began offering a replacement service for $99. I gotta make a disclaimer, I am an Apple lover, I have an iPad, I have an iPhone, I have a, I have a Mac computer. They normally get written up by Consumer Report as one of the best service companies around, but they are a little negligent on their batteries. Now, I really don't blame Apple for the problem. They figured a battery only can last so long anyway, that's true on your car, right? It's true on your hearing aids, right? It's true in your hearing aids, right? All right. They only last just so long and then they go out and we don't go back and complain to the people who made the hearing aid or the car. But people get mad about death, even the death of an iPad. People don't react well to the subject. People don't react well to their own death either. One wit once wrote, I'm not afraid to die. It's just I can't get up much enthusiasm for it. But despite the humor of the subject of death, most people fear it and avoid it. And that's why we've taken the time before we talk about the place where we're going after death is to deal a bit with the subject of death, hopefully to take a little bit of the fear away. Our world and society through the centuries have come up with different ways of trying to deal with the concept of death and what's afterwards. We spent a little bit of time a few weeks ago looking at the mystery of death and some of the views were disembodiment and reincarnation and extinction. Disembodiment basically says, hey, we lose our body, but our spirits are floating out there somewhere trying to figure out where to show up next. Reincarnation uh, held by many cultures and many other religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism and it's connected to karma. Um, if I do good in this life, I'll come back a little better in the next life. If I didn't do so good in this life, then I'm not going to come back better. I'll come back a little worse. Um, my yard has been infested with snails lately. And I've been asking them, what did you do to deserve this? <laughs> they haven't answered me yet. I, I, I've also asked them, what do you do to get better than this? I mean, what does a snail do to get better than being a snail? It's a challenging thought process. We've looked at extinction, that there's nothing. That's the view of, of atheism, is uh, you live, you die, and that's it, you're toast. Um, remember, just like making something legal doesn't make it moral. I want you to think through that a minute. Just because we've made something legal doesn't make it moral. Just because something is expected doesn't make it normal. When God originally created man, we created, he created us in his image, and that was to live forever. God is eternal, and when he breathed into man the breath of life, he breathed into him himself, he gave to Adam and Eve his Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternal. And when man sinned, the Holy Spirit of God departed from the human spirit of man and instantaneously he died spiritually and at that moment the dying process of the physical life began and now all men born die. Uh, that reality doesn't make it normal. But God is in the business of restoring things that are broken. He does it with our lives because of sin. He does it with our eternal life because of the finished work of his son, the Lord Jesus, which was resurrection from the dead. God is able to set things right, to clean up the mess that we've made. And that is the third point of the subject of death, is Easter is the solution to the afterlife. The final word is connected to what we celebrated at the beginning of this month, the Easter story, the resurrection of Jesus over death. When Jesus himself faced the, de faced the death of his friend Lazarus, and when Lazarus' sisters Mary and Martha suggested that somehow Jesus had failed him because his brother died, and I don't know if you know the story real well, but, but Mary and Martha had sent a message to Jesus. He was not in town at the time, and sent a message to him and said, hey, our brother is sick, and we think if you get here, you can make him well. And you know what Jesus did with that? He waited a couple of days. We get a message, somebody's in a hospital, we stop what we're doing and we rush there. Jesus waited. He waited till Lazarus died before he headed there. 
And he shows up and Mary Martha says, if you had been here, you could have done something about it. And Jesus just shakes his head and says, oh, Mary, oh, Martha, don't, you don't know who I am? And they said, but you waited so long. He, he now, some would say that Lazarus was maybe the first NDE. You know what NDE is, right? Near-death experience person. Wrong. He was a A-D-E. He was an actual death experience guy. He was dead so long that Mary Martha said, he stinks. Jesus, you showed up too long. He stinks. Jesus said, I'm in the business of making stinky things smell good. And he called Lazarus forth from the dead. The story says in his dra dra grave closed that Lazarus hopped out of the grave. And Jesus said to those standing around him, cut those death clothes off of him. He lives. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live again. Lazarus lived again. Now, because he lived physically again with his two sisters for a while longer, what does that mean had to happen to Lazarus again? He had to die again. Poor Lazarus had to go through that twice, man. He probably said, no, 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 leave me here. I was just fine. And then he had to come back and live with his sisters for several more years. <laughs> See, the Bible teaches us the afterlife is not Plato's disembodiment or Hinduism's reincarnation or atheism's extinction. The Bible's teaching is summed up in the word resurrection. As Major Thomas, I believe, asked that thought-provoking question, what is the antidote for death? And almost everybody figured out it must be life. And that's sort of right, but he said, no, resurrection. Raising the dead with life is the antidote to death. Since we as humans are composed of body, soul, and spirit, since we're not souls chained inside bodies and we're not bodies without souls, but since our essential identity is both physical and non-physical, our afterlife existence is going to be both body and soul. In this passage, Jesus claimed to hold the key to this existence, the resurrection of the body, reuniting of the body with the soul. Jesus claims that even though a person may die, the fullness of life awaits them on the other side. Look also at what Jesus said when he was dying on the cross to one of the thieves. Remember me, the thief said, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Somehow, even in the face of physical death, conscience existed awaited both Jesus and the thief on the other side. And we'll talk more about that later in the series. But for now, I want to state this third and final reality about life after death. Because Jesus Christ conquered death on Easter Sunday morning, we can trust what Jesus says about life. This is the central claim of the Christian faith, the literal resurrection from the dead. McKenna College professor of philosophy Stephen Davis says that this resurrection was so real, so historical, that the disciples had a camera, they could have taken a picture of the body of Jesus, just as Thomas could have touched the body of Jesus. The, the British uh, physicist John Polkyhorne is exactly correct when he said, the Christian's belief in a destiny beyond death finds its principal support in the particular event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The first century church exploded into existence. They had never known Christians. And then all of a sudden, in less than 100 years, Christianity flourished around the world. And do you know what governments were doing to Christians in their countries during that first century? They were trying to wipe them out. The heaviest persecution the church has probably ever known was in that very first century. Every government wanted them gone, and most religions wanted nothing to do with them. Have you ever read a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs? Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever read the book? Okay, five of you. Great. Uh, I, would, I would encourage all of you, go out and get a modern copy. Don't read the original. It's, it's old Elizabethan English. It's really hard to read. Mark might be the only one who could understand it, all right? Um, but, but get a current copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, it is not, I will tell you now, this is not bedtime reading. You don't want to read this right before you go to sleep. Um, but this is a very, very important book. Um, Paul was beheaded, 
Andrew, after being ordered by a Roman government to stop preaching Christ or, or face execution, reportedly told the Romans, I would not have preached the honor and the glory of the cross if I feared the death of your cross. Fox writes in this book of, of, of martyrs, he tells the story of many first century uh, saints, not just people that you find in the Bible, but he, people who came along later. He tells the story of how they died for their faith. He writes, death was not considered enough punishment for the Christians who were subjected to the cruelest treatment they could come up with. They were whipped, they were disemboweled, they were torn apart, they were stoned. Plates of hot iron were laid on them while alive. They were strangled, eaten by wild animals, alive, hung and tossed on the horns of bulls, alive. After they were dead, their bodies were piled in heaps and left to rot with burial. Nevertheless, the church continued to grow. Why? Because they were deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and watered with the blood of the saints on the foundation of the message of the resurrection from the dead. It didn't matter what this world does to this body. Where they were going was an eternal place of joy and delight. Today, so many of our churches seek to grow by telling people, just come here, we'll teach you how to be happy. Can you imagine one of those cute church signs with a catchy phrase, during the church, during the days of the Diocletian, during the days of the Fox's Book of Martyrs? What might have church side said back then? Be a target of Diocletian. Come suffer for the real king of kings. How about this one? Be a martyr for Jesus. Come learn how. Sunday, 3 a.m. before the Romans wake up. <laughs> I'm convinced the church continued to grow because their foundation was so firm, so solid, and the fact that nothing that this world can do from the body is going to prevent a body and spiritual resurrection. We can trust Jesus Christ because he rose from the grave. We don't have the time, but I want to recommend a book to you. It's written by J.P. Moreland, and it's called Beyond Death, Exploring the Evidence of Immortality. Listen to the introduction of the book. Conventional wisdom has it there are only two certainties of life, death and taxes. However, there is one main difference between them two. You can cheat on your taxes, but the grim reaper will not be denied. All of us will die. This is a book for people who will die, but it's not only about death. It all concerns life here and beyond. Bottom line in this book, we want our readers to realize that belief in immortality is real. It's not merely the result of faith. We try to show that our beliefs about immortality are rooted in the knowledge of what is real. The existence of the soul suggests life after death. If we are, if all we are is a body, then our brains are secreting our thoughts and beliefs like our livers secrete bile. We know from physics that our atoms are completely replaced every few years, which means there is no continuity to who I was, say, seven years ago and who I am today. But if we are composed of both body and soul, as the Bible claims and as many philosophers contend today, then it makes sense that we would survive physical death. Also, the need for justice suggests an afterlife. This is better than karma. <laughs> if, if God does exist and he is a just God, then in eternity he will set all things right. Everything that we have screwed up in this world, God will set straight in eternity. Finally, the hundreds of thousands of near-death experiences that are reported suggest there is an afterlife. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you that we can believe everything that somebody tells us who's had a near-death experience but the fact that so many people through the centuries have had near-death experiences tells us there is something on the other side. The reason I've always been a little skeptical of those who've had near-death experiences is because the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament. He said, I got caught up in a third heaven experience, and I can't tell you what I saw. Now, if Paul, under the inspiration of God's activity, can't tell us what he saw, how can somebody else try to tell us? But the fact that Paul had a NDE, and the fact that so many through the years have had them tells us there must be something on the other side. Some of them are fakes. Some of them are cons. You have to figure out the difference between some of them. Some of them are genuine. Some of them have come to faith in God because of a near-death experience. Others have tried to make money off of it. 
Uh, there are some preachers out there back in the 70s and the early 80s who wrote a couple of books. I knew this from my days at the Bible House. And they wouldn't write in the book what they had been told, but you had to send them a gift first, and then they would send you separately what they saw about heaven. That's a con artist and a shyster. Tyndale House is being sued by a boy who's now 21 years old because when he was eight and nine years old, Quote, he had a near-death experience, and Tyndale House published a book by his father relating the things in that near-death experience. And the son, as an adult now, says none of that was true. My father, yes, I was in the hospital. Yes, I was sick. Uh, yes, I'm so grateful that I'm alive. But those things didn't happen. My dad was trying to make a fortune. So we, we, we do have to be very careful. It's tough in this world to sometimes know the real thing from the fake thing. But all of these put together, and that first book that I told you about the first week that I'll be referring to uh, in the future by Burke um, is one which looks at so many different accounts of NDEs in our world. And he's not looking at the reliability of what they saw or experienced, but the fact that they had them tells us something is after life. There was a a great Scottish preacher by the name of Alexander McLaren. He preached in the 1800s. Listen to what he said. He said, many of us cling to life with a desperate clutch. Like some poor wretch pushed over a precipice is trying to dig his nails into the rock as he falls. Some of us cling to it because we dread what is beyond and our longing to live is the measure of our dread to die. But Paul did not look forward to a thick darkness of judgment or to nothingness. He saw in the darkness a great light. I love this. Listen to this, listen to this Scottish preacher. He said, Paul saw the light in the window of his father's house. Remember what Jesus said? Don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house are many rooms. Paul used a visual of home in my father's house, Paul said, hey, just like Motel 6, they left the light on for me. I know where I'm going. So this thing is okay. And Paul turned willingly away to his toil in the field God had called him. And he was more than content to drudge on as long as he could do anything in the work of God. And blessed are they who shares Paul's desires to depart and his victorious willingness to stay in labor. They shall find that such a life in the flesh is being with Christ. He is no more in a strait betwixt the two or unwitting what he should choose. Paul chooses nothing, but he accepts the appointment to a higher wisdom than his own. There is rest for him in this life as for us. And in ceasing from our own wishes and laying our will silent and passive at the feet of Jesus. God, I'm ready to come home when you call me and I'm ready to stay and be your man or woman in this world, whatever your pleasure. The Strait of Gibraltar is the strait that connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. On either side of the Strait of Gibraltar, there are two mountains. They were known in ancient times as the pillars of, you Hercules fans, you should have known that. According to Greek mythology, Hercules built these pillars to mark the edge of the world. Remember, in those days, people believed that the earth was flat. The pillars, the pillars there bore this warning. No more beyond. And it cautioned sailors, don't go any further. Well, that's wind. What kind of wind? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This was a serious moment. Let me get back to it. But in 1492, Christopher Columbus destroyed the belief that there was no more beyond. When he sailed through the Atlantic Ocean and he discovered the new world, in the town where Columbus died, there stands a monument commemorating him. And on this monument is the statue of a lion. And the lion's paw is tearing away that two-letter word, no, leaving the last two words, more beyond. 
You see, Columbus had proven that there was more beyond. Whether people believe it or not, there is more beyond this life and this world. Heaven is a real place. The question is, will you go there when you die? Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Heaven is the eternal destiny of everyone who puts his or her faith in Jesus Christ. Max Licato in his book, Six Hours, One Friday, tells the story of a missionary in Brazil who discovered a tribe of Indians in the remote part of the jungle. They lived near a very large river and the tribe was in need of serious medical attention. There was a contagious disease ravaging the population. People were dying daily. There was a hospital the other side of the river, not too far away, but the Indians would not cross the river because they believed the river contained evil spirits and to enter the water would mean certain death. The missionary explained how he had crossed the river many times and was unharmed, but the Indians were not impressed. He then took them to the bank of the river and he put his hands in the water and they still wouldn't go in. He walked into the water up to his waist and he splashed water up in his face and it didn't matter. They were still afraid to enter the river. Finally, the missionary dove into the river, swam beneath the surface until he emerged on the other side. He walked up on the bank, raised his fist triumphant in the air. He had entered the water and escaped. It was then that the Indians broke into a cheer and they followed him across. God, guys, isn't that what Jesus did Easter morning? He entered the river of death and he came out the other side so that no longer do you and I have to be afraid of death because we have eternal life. You want to go to heaven? You can't achieve it. You can only receive it. And you receive it when you receive Jesus Christ in your life. You can't work to earn it. You can't give enough to buy it. All you can do is humbly say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come live in my life. Bring to me your eternal life in the here and now so that when I leave this world, I know where I'm going. It's not any more complicated than that. If you've never done that, before we start talking about heaven itself, why don't you take care of that business today? Would you join with me in a closing prayer? And if you need to invite Christ in your life, why don't you do it right here and now? If you're uncertain, if you're unsure that you've ever done this, then why not take care of business right now? Let's pray. Father in heaven, death is such a a discouraging subject to talk about, and yet it is through the door of death that we find the greatest adventure and experience and sights and scenes that we'll ever know in our life. And that incredible place will be ours forever if we simply, though it's not always easy to admit our sin, but it is simple to invite you in and say, Lord Jesus, I want to walk with you through life and then through the valley of the shadows of death and enter into the good of the Father's house. So I invite you in, Lord Jesus. For 30 more seconds, just keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. If you're here today and during that prayer, you, you made sure you invited Jesus in your life. Just, I'm not going to come to you afterwards. I'm not going to harass you in any way, but I'd just like to give thanks later in the day for this choice you made. If you invited Christ in your life just now, raise your hand and put it right back down. Nobody's going to bother you. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Father, thank you so much. You hear our prayers, no matter how quiet or private they may be, you hear them and you answer them. And thank you today for those who did business with you. Give us wisdom as we talk about your forever home in the weeks ahead. We trust you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Happy Rodeo Day. See Mark out there. Lots of things going on. Men's ministry. The big shoot. All right. See him for that.